I'd like to, we would like to start our presentation by thanking our hosts, by thanking Francis, Sarah, and Betsy, and the whole center for inviting us. We're very happy to be here, very stimulated by the discussions that have been done so far. And today we're going to talk about uh, a course that hasn't been taught yet. So we're doing that very much in the, the spirit, spirit of workshop and we'd love to hear from you whatever criticisms, opinions, uh, contributions you have to offer. We'd be very happy with that. Uh, so the title of our course is Buddhism and Science, a Critical Introduction to the Encounter. Anyway, so I would like to start by talking about uh, the background uh, to this course, like how it came about, and that happened in this very place that you're seeing on the screen there, and that's called Gondi, uh, Germany, Austria, even though it's called like that, it's actually in Austria, not in Germany, and that's one of the centers of uh, Chogini Rinpoche, who is this uh, Tibetan Lama who lives in Nepal and who we have been talking a lot about and there is a reason for that. He, he is someone that's very much concerned about uh, education, including like education in uh, uh, Western terms, so in terms of ac academia and everything. So it's a very interesting Lama in, in that way. So Chogini uh, Rinpoche, when while we were attending a retreat two, two years ago, uh, invited us to uh, teach a summer course there. And this is a summer course uh, pretty much in the model of what Julia described uh, just now. So we taught that last uh, um, year, last summer. Also, uh, John Dunn also took part in our course also last summer, and he'll take again uh, this summer. And uh, the idea of this summer course is to uh, sow the seeds of a Buddhist university that Chogini Marimpoche wants to create in, uh, in Austria, in this uh, very location. So um, we launched this idea by uh, starting to, start, uh, to, to teach this uh, summer course last year. Yes, and now we've uh, been implicated in another year of this, and so <laughs> we're sort of rolling it out and uh, you know addressing this issue of uh, Buddhism and science as that uh, as a, kind of the explicit content and topic for that course. Um, the venue, just to explain a little bit about it, it's um, it, this image doesn't nearly capture the beauty and uh, kind of general awesomeness of this place. It's gorgeous, and it's in the pre-Alps and in uh, you know northern Austria within about a two-hour drive to uh, Vienna and many other cities, so it's very centrally located in Europe. Um, it's a, the site of a Buddhist community of practitioners, actually. So they're hosting uh, fairly continuously uh, lamas and monks and nuns to come there and engage in various activities, ritual activities, contemplative activities, retreats, and so forth. So there's a, also a residence, full-time residence at this place. that are, They have a, kind of a ritual... A calendar as well as a ritual schedule on a daily basis that's modeled after uh, the, uh, the the home monastery in uh, Nepal, Kanyin Shidderplin. So um, just to skip into it, um, who would possibly do such a strange thing as uh, go to Austria to study Buddhism, actually? Because, you know, part of it is uh, that there's the fear also because we're connected. Uh, it's a branch, really, in a sense, of uh, Ranjo Yeshi Institute in Nepal that we might siphon off the students <laughs> of uh, you know, the, the, the summer programs that are running in Kathmandu. And uh, maybe you have that issue, <laughs> that concern in your minds right now as I, as I uh, you know, kind of roll this uh, out. But um, we're hoping to pitch this to uh, undergraduates, actually, from North America and Europe and all over the world, in fact and to try to kind of reach beyond the usual Ranjong Yeshe network. Um, but we do expect, I mean, my experience with uh, undergrads is, uh, generally speaking, is that they come to uh, study Buddhism for the big questions, you know, that they're really interested in existential issues more than they are in kind of religious studies issues. They want to uh, engage with Buddhism. And I, I was the same as, a, you know, as, a, as an undergraduate. I was also disappointed when I uh, realized that uh, they were just going to give me some 
you know, reference and a text and send me on my way and that my, uh, you know, that my teachers in the university were not Buddhist masters and so forth. So I was super naive, obviously. But so we're hoping to kind of reach out to those naive students <laughs> globally <laughs> and kind of draw them in through this uh, very appealing topic of uh, Buddhism and science and uh, a special approach to it. Um, so... Yeah, so, uh, and I mean, still speaking about this idea of the ideal uh, student, which and that totally uh, connects with our next uh, topic, which is uh, the centrality of the idea of the encounter in our course. Uh, but, and how this uh, making the encounter the, the center really kind of intensifies a sense of reflexivity and that's what we are looking for. So, and not only one or, but like, uh, and we are trying to uh, create that in like in different uh, levels or dimensions and through different approaches. So, one approach is historical, and of course we have to go back to the colonial period to reflect upon how the basis uh, for this uh, encounter between Buddhism and science was created, but we're gonna go beyond that, and in many ways our approach is much more like focus on the dialogue than on some kind of, I don't know, uh, just adaptation of Buddhism or things like that, but I think there is a lot of exchange there that I've been, we've been observing in the last uh, few decades, uh, couple of decades at least, so th that will be our focus. Uh, there is also uh, an epistemological uh, approach, and by that I mean like to look at these two, uh, let's say, traditions, Buddhism and science, as systems of knowledge and practice of their own, and how this encounter happens. And so that's m one of our approaches. And the next one's about social, political, uh, issues and by that I mean it's like uh, to talk to uh, to talk about like actual encounters between religious specialists, scientists, communities, and, and trying to think uh, about what kind of impact that has for our societies at large. Oh yeah, and then there's the um, pedagogical dimension, of course. So we're we're kind of coming from this uh, metacognitive awareness uh, perspective which is really an effect of this encounter, in a sense, in pedagogy. But we're sort of trying to bring it back and reflect it back through uh, the encounter and make students aware of that as a practice, actually, incorporating it and make them, making them aware, sort of meta-meta, I guess you could say, kind of uh, ratcheting it up a, a further level even. And then that gets us to the personal components of uh, con uh, contemplative practice itself. So uh, meditation will be a... a explicit and uh, major component of, of the course along the lines of what uh, Julia described uh, with the, just the general RYI summer courses. But uh, a little bit, um, we'll see how it, how it differs actually, uh, how yeah. this will have to differ. And in that sense, like to go back a little bit to this idea of the ideal student. So our ideal student would have to have some kind of ethnographic spirit and to be uh, in a situation of participant observation and maybe to take on the role of this, you know, the famous uh, scholar practitioner that is really a guiding principle in the Rangjong Yeshe Institute uh, activities. So, and we think that the venue will uh, offer some kind of ethnographic lab because like immersive kind of ethnographic lab. Students will have nowhere to go, Basically. even more than in Kathmandu. <laughs> Worse than Kathmandu, it'll be you know hours away from anywhere. Like so Kathmandu there's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, Kathmandu is a lot of fun. You can go downtown. You can do things here. There's a little pub, you know, at the bottom of the hill in Austria. It does sausages and beer, and that's pretty much it. Otherwise, you're on a train to Vienna, so it's even more intensive. But there's a lot of nature around, so a lot of space to kind of walk and you know, uh, just explore the hills and, and everything. So um, in terms of the actual courses that are part of the summer program, it's really quite similar to what Julia described. You have a Buddhist contemplative practice component where people are doing meditation every day, and then a textual study component where uh, there's a... So uh, those two are going to be taught by a, a monastic scholar. Um, we'll get into the contemplative practice and uh, part of the problems with that that are 
really uh, um, Philippe outlined so well actually already today. So, um, so those two aspects, and then the third aspect will be an academic course, which will then just muddy the waters and create all of those uh, very uncomfortable dissonances and interesting uh, synergies with those other two, focusing on these three dimensions, really, social, scientific, historical, and philosophical approaches. We thought about, and that's very provisional, not definitive at all, but a few uh, student learning outcomes. So we think that by the end of this course, uh, the student would be able to demonstrate a critical understanding of the dialogue between Buddhism and science. It would be able to uh, identify the major issues at stake in the interaction between these two systems of knowledge and practice. Uh, the student will be able to critically evaluate different scholarly, scientific, and popular approaches to the encounter. And finally, uh, the student will be able to develop reflexive awareness of their positions uh, within the history and future aspirations of this encounter. Yeah, it seems kind of ambitious as we recite it now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so we're going sort of the backwards, you know, model here, I okay. guess. So assessments. Um, this is super provisional, so just bear with us. And please, if anyone has ideas, I mean, really, we're, we're really just laying it out for you for feedback. So um, there, will, there is an application process. So there's a kind of questionnaire that students will have to answer in order to be part of it, and a little essay that they have to answer. What, what is it, you know, why do they want to be part of this, and, and background, and so forth. But we thought of doing kind of entrance interviews that are a little bit more intensive to kind of uh, you know, focus on some of those issues, go a little bit deeper with the students, and try to elicit some sort of uh, self-reflective sort of capacity about their role in, in, in the uh, program, why they want to be in it, what they expect to get out of it, and so forth. Likewise, we want to try to incorporate exit interviews, so almost like debriefings or something like that, where there's a, you know, an assessment, it, beyond just uh, evaluation or whatever, something that goes a little bit uh, uh, beyond that to get uh, students um, to reflect on how they're going to really take that forward or what use it, it's been for them or not. And uh, you know, we can use that also for any future uh, kind of uh, you know, offering. So then contemplative practice journal. This is something that a lot of people have done where you just sort of, I mean, our idea with this really is to not make it something that we look at explicitly, you know, and read. It's really the space for them to reflect on the whole process and what's going on with them. And we try to encourage, well, we will try to encourage a kind of multimedia approach where it's not just writing discursively about whatever it is. Um, you know, they can draw, they can do whatever they want. A journal sort of writ large, I guess you could say. So it can, it can kind of spill out of the pages of a book and be in any format. But it's just, a, you know, the, the, the assessment will be just to ensure that they've done something like that or that they've engaged in, in some way or another, through some, some medium or another. So, of course, class discussions, um, that's just a given, I suppose. Uh, reflection essays, that's a little bit prosaic, but um, it's hard to know how to assess where people, students are at, I think. Um, short, very short, little micro-essays, uh, we're thinking, you know, to kind of, uh, kind of gauge student involvement and, in, uh, you know, where they're at with uh, different um, issues of, of discussion. And then the, the final project will be a group project and presentation. Uh, and this is adapted from a uh, course that's offered at the University of Virginia, Meditation in the Modern World, which is um, a massively popular course. There's 250 students sometimes in that. And, and I, was, I taught that course once. It's sort of a, a set curriculum. It's kind of you just... They just plug instructors into that. So I was there once, and uh, one of the one of the assignments, which I thought was interesting, is to have students take uh, one of the contemplative practices from from Buddhism and sort of apply it to a different domain that they're um, that they're involved in, whether it be teaching or the arts or business or whatever, and then analyze as a kind of second order reflection what are the problems of doing that, what are the possibilities of doing that in light of. Uh, you know, the discussions we've had, the readings we've covered, and so forth. So that's it for now. But, um, you know, like we said, we're extremely open to anything else you could bring. 
And so just to give you an idea of our daily schedule, so the, the course will run from the 29th of June to the 24th of July, so it's about four weeks. And as Julia described, uh, too, so it's just like the, the structure is the same as the summer course in Kathmandu. So from 7.30 to 8.30 you have guided morning meditation, and then there is breakfast, and then from 9.45 to 11 there will be a Buddhist lecture by a monastic teacher, and that will be like the same teacher in, in a general way. And from 11.15 to 12.30, there'll be uh, our uh, academic class. And in the afternoon, the afternoons are free. There's time for self-study, reading, and online discussion, if we decide to do that this time. And, uh, and sometimes in the weekends and during the week, there are special events, and that's also optional. Uh, and finally, there is an optional meditation retreat, so that's an innovation here. We decided to make it optional. Usually the retreat is part of the summer course, but in that case, th that would be optional. But they will have a lot of uh, um, opportunities, opportunities to engage uh, with contemplative practices. Yeah, this is kind of a laundry list of um, contemplative practices that our Lama Lopan taught last year in the uh, summer program there in Austria. And as you can see from this list, it really is quite the range. I mean, it's pretty much everything short of initiation and full-on tantric practice. And it's, you know, highly ritualized practice, things that involve uh, contemplating ideas and views, Buddhist views, so deep introspection about uh, karma cause and effect and the nature of suffering and non-self and so forth. Refuge is involved, so there's kind of devotional practices that are there. Um, there are some practices, a few, that resonate well with this kind of secularized meditation practices. Um, but those are always being done in a very, uh, you know, traditional context in which they're encapsulated within ritual practices, uh, recitations, and so forth. Um, so really, you get this very rich picture of a, of a whole swath of uh, contemplative practices that are offered in the, um, in the Tibetan tradition, right? So they, they kind of cross over view, meditation, conduct, involving ethics, and so forth. So it's a very messy kind of... Uh, picture and this is this is uh, true to what we saw last summer. So this is just a kind of from memory and hoping that that can happen again in the in the coming summer. Oh, so then the yeah the Buddhist textual study component. This is a little bit of a wish for us, but um, and maybe if it doesn't work out, it's better. But um, there's a recent uh, um, the first volume in a series has been published, um, edited by Tupten Jimpa. Science and Philosophy in the Indian uh, Buddhist Classics, which really culls from Abhidharma and Pramana presentations. And it's written in Tibetan originally, and then it was translated into English. So we're hoping, and then there's another one on, the first one is about the physical world, sort of presentations that uh, Tibetan scholars have kind of culled that they think dialogue well with science. And then there's the mind, which is already done, and it's kind of in a uh, page-proof uh, stage right now, so that's, that's coming out soon. So we're hoping that um, our uh, monastic teacher will be teaching from those texts, <laughs> but um, there's also talk of uh, just straight-up Abhidharma, um, which, you know, this stuff is derived from, these books are derived from, so that also might work, but it would be uh, a lot more interesting, I think, for the students, a little bit uh, more boring for them to just go through a regular old Abhidharma presentation. I mean, no, not, you know, I hope no, you Abhidharma Wallace out there are not uh, offended by my remark. <laughs> but uh, that's just my opinion. And, and finally, as we talked a little bit about already, we have our academic course, and uh, uh, James and I, we're going to teach it together uh, during the time we are there, but there will be also a section that will be taught only by John Dunn, uh, more or less in the middle of our course. And from our perspective, again, we're going to take a historical approach, 
But the main basis of our uh, reflection, let's put it that way, is really like an anthropological and social and science and techno uh, technology studies approach. So to really uh, try to uh, understand critically uh, what this encounter between Buddhism and science means. And um, uh, the idea here is really to, uh, I mean, we have one main author in, in mind, who is Bruno Latour, and James and I, we have considered his writings very much in our own personal uh, research, uh, and we like him, and he's really fantastic to think about these uh, ideas of uh, science and also uh, the way, uh, the, the kind of, as we're going to see, uh, I assign, we assign at least one uh, article by him, uh, the role that laboratories play in rebuilding and recreating society. So I think that's a very crucial kind of topic uh, about Buddhism and science, and that would be like a, an important part uh, of our uh, theoretical reflections upon, upon it. And other uh, authors that we have in mind, like uh, Marilyn Stratton, or even uh, Viveiro de Castro, who is this great Brazilian anthropologist, and they're all part of what has been called in anthropology the ontological turn in anthropology. And I'm not going to go into details here about what is that, but uh, I think it suffice to say that it's a, it's a kind of, it's a turn in which like ideas like reflexivity, uh, conceptualization, and also experimentations are even more uh, emphasized and also uh, treated in very different ways, the idea of conceptualization, the, the idea of our like uh, uh, categories, categories like religion, society, individual, these are all, these are all being questioned by these uh, anthropologists. So uh, that's a little bit of this questioning that we want to bring uh, to, our, to our class. And the philosophical part? Yeah, the, the, um, yeah about us, I mean, Anna is a cultural anthropologist, and I'm a textualist, so that's why you know you can sort of see that marriage coming through here in these different approaches. <laughs> uh, just to give you a little bit of background there, so um, the philosophical side, we're hoping John Don will swoop in and do something. Um, uh, he has, I don't know if you've ever heard him lecture on uh, this concept of uh, reflective awareness, self, uh, you know, free flexivity in, in uh, pramana literature. So he's got this. Um, really interesting uh, set of lectures about this concept of uh, svasamviti in, in Sanskrit or rangrik in Tibetan and uh, that uh, resonates really nicely with this uh, you know the theme of uh, reflexivity and it's, it's just sort of a <coughs> doctrinal kind of parallel that, that, that we have there. So mm -hmm. we uh, uh, came up with a few topics and they are far from being exhausted they're not going to exhaust the subject at all there is some narrative that we are attempting to, to tell, uh, but that uh, is also subject to change. So I'm just going to go very briefly through the topics. And there is like some kind of reading list, but that's not definitive at all. It's just like the few things we've been thinking about. So first, we, the first topic, we thought that it would be interesting to just talk about the, uh, the nature of the encounter. And uh, so uh, the first, uh, some of the first readings that uh, came to mind was Lopez uh, in his introduction to Buddhism and science, and in it he at least um, tells a little bit this, the story of this colonial encounter, and that's, uh, that can offer an interesting background. And also Francisca Cho, I think there are other, and, uh, there are other uh, articles by her that might be even more interesting here, but uh, we thought about that first. And uh, the second topic, uh, Buddhism and psychology, uh, because in history and now, so the idea is like uh, to uh, go back a little bit in time and, uh, I mean, to understand really this encounter between Buddhism and psychology uh, as the basis for this future encounter between Buddhism and science. That's at least the, the way we see it a little bit. So here we, yeah, we 
uh, dealing with two sets of uh, uh, articles or readings that reflect, you know, like some past vision of it and some kind of more current uh, vision of it. So, topic three is Buddhism goes to the lab, and, and there we're gonna uh, focus on the pioneer work of uh, Dr. Herbert Benson. Uh, I don't know spell his name. <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, and also that's where we're going to read this uh, text by Bruno Latour that we hoped that would give a certain tone to the course and uh, we might include other, other uh, articles by him too. So topic three, uh, the birth of contemplative science, then it's just like a, there, there what we have is a list of different, very different genealogies, genealogies of this, the, the contemplative science idea. So we, we don't think that we can assign all of this text, that this is also for us, for our own reference. And, but we would like to think about these uh, different uh, genealogies. And, uh, and then one topic about mind, mindfulness-based stress reduction and the idea of mindful revolution. And so we're going to be discussing that. And, and here is, a, uh, yeah. And then uh, next topic is the Mind and Life Institute, another that we consider like another uh, landmark uh, uh, of this uh, for this Buddhism and science encounter and topic seven uh, this idea of Buddhism and the science of happiness I think if there is one cultural effect that for me at least the most <coughs> visible of like uh, this encounter between Buddhism and science is, is this idea of like different ideas of happiness mm -hmm. that you know, not only that scientists, but also that Buddhists like Mingo Rinpoche and Matyo Hika, they have embraced it and embraced their experience in the lab and their experience with uh, scientists and put that in like popular Dharma books. So we're going to be analyzing that and also um, uh, more kind of scholarly uh, work. And this video is interesting because it shows this new format and we have the scientists and the lama sitting side by side and talking about Buddhism and the benefits of it and doing meditation with the public and I find that fascinating. So topic eight is uh, Buddhism technology and there we uh, gonna sign a, a chapter by Anne, her new great book. <laughs> really good and other stuff too, like about this engagement uh, with technology. And, uh, and then we hope to initiate a discussion here, how Buddhism is mindfulness, so this idea is like this, also this recent publication that has kind of put in, it's had a, into suspicion the teaching of uh, meditation in public schools and is it Buddhist, is it religious at all. So we're going to be discussing that and also the idea of how scientific is meditation, is it, can it be, become something scientific, can it become, and by scientific maybe we also mean here secularized. And uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> we're going to go uh, maybe end it with this, this discussion about the idea of secularism. And there we have the Dalai Lama who, in his book, uh, Beyond Religion, really talks about uh, this idea of re rethinking uh, secularism. He, what he wants is that uh, science has some kind uh, he wants uh, the, maybe what he's proposing is really the, the creation of some kind of secular ethics, the creation and adoption of it. And his model is the Indian model of secularism. So. Uh, not against religion, but uh, like for a plurality of religion and uh, religions and ideas, and also including in it ethnic. You know. And then Bachelor, who has been trying, and is well known for trying to put Buddhism into a more secular voice. Yeah. So uh, this is just a, con a few <laughs> concluding leads. Um, uh, Questioning divides. This came up in, in Julia's uh, 
talk very powerfully, and um, that's what we see as the great potential of this kind of course. Uh, the summer course in RYI is the model, you know, juxtapos juxtaposing a, a lot of different models and just sort of having students um, in some kind of uh, intensive environment work it out, so to speak. If they don't go insane, they'll uh, <laughs> come out uh, stronger, perhaps, and with a lot of um, uh, perhaps nuanced notions of uh, biases that have been exposed in the process. So. Um, especially with respect to certain divisions, certain divides that we'd like to uh, call into question uh, through the course and uh, hopefully elicit students to call into question in their own lives and their own um, mentalities. Um, of course, religion and science being the, the main one of those. Uh, mind and matter, another one important. And then we get into other divisions like rationality and belief, tradition and modernity, <coughs> the global and the local, the West and the non-West, I and mean, we could go on and on. Um, much of it will be uh, focused on revision and nuance of what they think Buddhism is all about, what they think science is all about, and where they find themselves within that. So um, the, the critical spirit of this is not um, taking sides against or, or what have you, or for or against anything, but really creating a container where um, a lot of... Uh, uh, consideration and a lot of um, kind of uh, excavation, I guess, of personal biases and personal ways of dividing the world can come to the surface for people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you said enough, but uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, of course, I have more to say. <laughs> no, it's just um, yeah, of course. It's a little bit like uh, the divides and also the terms themselves, like in the spirit of this ont ontological turn in anthropology, even questioning this idea of religion and science, this kind of divide. Is it what's religion? You know, that's our kind of invasion, invention, right? Anyway, so uh, I just want to add that. That's all. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay.